Well, it seems we are all together now. <laughs> Welcome again. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, I was saying that uh, COVID pandemic showed us that the health of our economy depends on all business, no matter their size. Uh, now, as we enter the new normal, uh, it's clear that only when the smallest returns to business as usual, we can declare success. Uh, but getting to this point depends on business resilience. We have a distinguished panel here today of uh, entrepreneurs and policymakers um, who will share their thoughts and experience on COVID-19 resilience, especially the importance of international trade. Um, some housekeeping before we start, if you allow me. Uh, for the first half of the session, I'm going to start today's conversation with some questions for each of our panelists. After this, I will turn the floor over to you, the audience, to ask questions of your own for the last part of our time together. Um, questions will be received through both the chat function uh, of this virtual platform and as well as from all you here in the room uh, for those in the room, uh, please write your questions on the paper uh, provided and pass it to the facilitators, please. Uh, they will be around in the room. Uh, separately, interpretation is available in both French and Spanish for all those listening to us. Um, this event is also being recorded uh, and will be made available at the end of the public forum. Um, so, logistics aside, let me welcome Ms. Pamela Koch Hamilton uh, to provide us with some very insight, if I may say, introductory words. So, Pamela, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I'm really pleased to be here. Thanks for the invitation, uh, fellow panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to be here with you all today, and it's great to be back at the WTO Public Forum. And it's actually public. I see people, which is great. This is a space that brings voices outside of the WTO inside and gives them a platform to share their perspectives, their experiences, and their concerns. And their voice matters. And we will hear from them today from the MSMEs. This is why I'm especially pleased that we have turned our focus today to MSMEs and the impact of COVID-19. As we chart a path for recovery and resilience, we must remember our true north. I think the reason many of us entered the international trade field is that we wanted better for our communities. We wanted to fix global inequalities. We wanted enhanced economic opportunities for those in need. So as we come here today to discuss how we can enhance resilience for the future, I want us to have a clear picture of who we truly work for and what we strive for. I know I'm in good company when I say that MSMEs are the backbone of our global economy. They account for about 90% of businesses and over 60% of employment in most economies. Yet small businesses were among the hardest hit in the pandemic. The numbers tell a clear story. In our 2020 SME Competitiveness Outlook, sought to de we sought to determine the effects of the pandemic on small businesses. Firm level surveys across regions show that 60% of micro and 57% of small businesses were very negatively affected, compared with only 43% for large firms. The UND reports that in El Salvador, small businesses saw a 60% drop in sales in August 2020. In the United States, the World Economic Forum states over a third of small businesses are closed in 2021. Today, we're starting to see a rebound, with global exports in June up 35% year on year. There's some signs of recovery across most sectors, However, this only tells us part of the story. Financial institutions around the world warn that we are headed towards a K-shaped recovery. While many developed countries can entertain the idea of post-pandemic recovery, many developing countries are entering their third and fourth waves. Unfortunately, we found that size matters for resilience in the face of lingering challenges. It is predicted that technology-driven and large firms will see the greatest gains for recovery while many small businesses will be slower to recover and jump back into the trade space. Make no mistake, an unequal recovery can and will exacerbate existing inequalities. 
We cannot afford to leave small businesses behind. How do we empower smaller firms, the very foundation of our global economy, to become more resilient in our global recovery? The vulnerabilities faced by MSMEs are multidimensional, and so we should approach our resilience building in the same manner. The future is being shaped by several competing trends and forces. We must grapple with the immediate threats of the prolonged COVID-19 pandemic, but we must also tackle the climate crisis. We also have to help businesses adapt to the changing trade space that is increasingly driven by digital technology, artificial intelligence, and e-commerce. I'd like to share how I believe we can address the factors to build long-lasting resilience for MSMEs. First, I'd like to go back to the importance of MSMEs having a voice in the international trade space. If we want to truly address the weaknesses of our trading systems, we must hear from those who are affected and take them seriously. Only when we truly listen can we respond. Our very own WTO informal working group on MSMEs, chaired by the very energetic and dynamic Ambassador Cancela, drew attention to this fact. MSMEs need a stronger voice in the WTO, but we need to go a step further. They need regulatory frameworks that provide support, access to market information, and make trade facilitation a priority. They also need increased access to finance and cross-border payments to ensure that their businesses can compete in a changing international market. We have pulled together recommendations to put in place the building blocks for firm resilience and a genuinely inclusive recovery. Secondly, I would like to draw attention to the existential threat of the climate crisis. Time is quickly running out to avoid irreversible damage due to climate change. With each passing year, the cost of adopt adaptation continues to rise and effects on our people and planet become more devastating. Increasingly, we not only have to prepare for harsh economic shocks, but for environmental ones as well. Taking an example from my home region of the Caribbean, small businesses saw sources of revenue wiped out due to the pandemic, but also valuable infrastructure damaged due to hurricanes. Attempts at business continuity become that much more difficult and costly for small businesses. Many simply do not have the financial means or know-how to adapt business operations quickly to become more climate resilient. Sustainability is more than just this year's latest buzzword. We must help small businesses to implement greener business practices through innovative financing mechanisms, affordable green technology and training. Resilience to the climate crisis has a direct relationship to the bottom line of MSMEs. When businesses have these resources at their disposal, the positive effects are undeniable. I'm pleased to see Mechi Ama on this panel today, who is a testament to this fact. Her story of tenacity in the face of the pandemic is inspiring. Mechi started the cosmetic company, Black and Natural Cosmetics. The pandemic presented harsh challenges to her new business, and she needed to find a way to stay afloat. So she received coaching from the Ye community to help her brand her business at lower cost and gain organic certification to capture new consumers. In less than a year, Michi saw her sales jump by almost 30%. And I want to just read something from the pamphlet she gave me uh, earlier today. It says, here is beauty, here is emotion, here is our heritage. Hair improves our self-confidence. It tells us who we are, where we have been, and where we are going. And I'm emotional about that because if you're a black woman, you know the hair thing, right? <laughs> you, you know the hair thing, yeah? We go from curly to straight to, yes. Anyway, the point is she deals with hair, but she not just only deals with hair, she deals with identity, and she deals with ownership, and all of that matters. So. I'm pleased to see Michi on the panel today, who is a testament to the fact of intervention being not only about money, but about people. Her story of tenacity in the pandemic is admirable. Results like these can be replicated and scaled. As an international community, we can do much more to help small businesses to make this green transition successfully. Lastly, I'd like to speak on the fourth industrial revolution. We've heard before that digital is the future. The face of business has less to do with a brick and mortar location and more to do with web design. 
However, for many small firms in developing countries, the barriers to entry in the international e-commerce marketplace are too high. This is harder still with little or no access to reliable internet. Enhancing firm resilience is closely linked to digital connectivity to take advantage of the continuing boom in e-commerce. Through its Ecom Connect activities, ITC is fostering MSME's ability to make use of digital innovations such as new payment systems and logistics to trade online. But there's room to scale up and we need global buy-in. This is why tools such as the Global Trade Help Desk with WTO, ITC and UNCTAD are examples of how we can enhance and access to key trade market information. Born out of this tripartite collaboration, we've also engaged with ICC national chambers, economic and trade ministries, and BSOs to help firms get access to the free digital tool. As we build anticipation towards MC12, <laughs> we recognize that this is an opportunity we cannot afford to miss. So we are at this critical juncture. The WTO informal group has set an ambitious agenda. I hope that we will get to the point where it's adapted, adopted by the 164 and that we move on today. I want to leave you today with a quote from former Jamaican Prime Minister Michael Manley. And I think it fits the challenge we face today. Any realistic vision of change must be based on the notion of empowerment of people. Resilience building at its core is about empowerment. The levers of change should also be held by the MSMEs who are the pillars of our economies and communities. They are key to our post-pandemic recovery and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pamela, for your very important considerations on supporting Ms. Ms. Resilience and for your very inspiring words. Um, these are key points as uh, we continue to emerge from the pandemic and take these uh, lessons forward with us into the future. So thank you very much uh, again. <laughs> and thank you for your kind words, by the way. <laughs> well, let me now uh, introduce today's panel. Uh, with us today, we have uh, Mrs. Michi Ame, um from Cameroon. Uh, she's the founder uh, of uh, Black and Natural Cosmetic, as was just um, introduced by Pamela. Uh, that's a hair product manufacturing company. Uh, we have also Mr. Seun Awolowo. He's the director of the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, uh, which promotes uh, non-oil export from Nigeria with a goal of diversifying the Nigerian economy. Uh, we have also uh, Mrs. Uh, Riz Fernandez. Uh, she is uh, virtual with us today. Uh, she's president and founder and partner of Rise to Reach, a fashion and design house empowering community artisans from the Philippines. And we have also Maria Isabel Montoya Duarte, who has a long career in the public and private sector, and she is founder of Nika Hat, that's a Nicaraguan handmade uh, hat manufacturing company. And um, last but not least, we have uh, Mrs. Rosa Whitaker. She's uh, CEO of the Whitaker Group and former U.S. Uh, government policy leader. So uh, welcome again to, to all of you. Um, let's start uh, today's discussions with you, Mrs. Sana. Um, Black and Natural was particularly impacted by the COVID uh, crisis, and you you noted you were unable to buy raw materials from China and uh, Nigeria. So given the challenges you experience, uh, can you tell us in three, five minutes whether the pandemic has changed the way uh, you use uh, trade for your business? Floor is yours, ma'am. Hello, everyone, um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to Thank you once more for inviting me for such a wonderful opportunity to talk about myself, my business, and my experiences. Um, accept greetings from Cameroon and from my team, Black and Natural. So yes, Black, uh, the pandemic affected my business operations 
seriously. You know, we're not only faced with a pandemic, we're equally faced with internal conflict. So the business was struggling with both the internal conflict and the pandemic. So it was really challenging for us. Our productions went down, our sales went down. And for once, I was really afraid that my business was going to shut down. So I started thinking, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? The very first thing, I diversified. So I decided to open a beauty salon where we practice social distancing measures. We gave priority to customers who booked on appointments. We encouraged the public to book on appointments. We, um, to, in order to avoid overcrowding at the saloon, we equally provided face masks and disinfectants, uh, disinfectants and all of that. So that way we were able to uh, keep sales running. So we produce now in the lab and we sent to the saloon, they use, and our customers now could easily buy some and take home. Equally, we were able to, initially we used to source from Nigeria for raw materials, but with the pandemic, Nigeria was under lockdown, so it was almost impossible to get them. Do we stop producing? No, we had to look for another alternative. So we started looking for alternative raw materials locally in Cameroon. Well, at first it was a little difficult with the research, but subsequently we got on our feet in order not to compromise the quality because we are trying to keep it 100% natural. We finally decided to look source for local raw materials to be able to stay in production. And equally, we used to buy bottles from China. It's way cheaper. It's really, really cheaper um, buying from China. So we now had to start seeing other means through which we could package. For example, we used to produce liquid shampoo. Now we started producing shampoo and conditioner bars, which not only help us to save the environment from plastics, but equally it cut our production costs. So um, with the lockdown and with the conflict, a lot of people in my, in my community were now glued to their phones. A lot of youths were using TikTok, were using Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp. So we had to engage online. To maybe that's how we directly meet our customers. So we had to do a lot of short stories, short um, videos to en engage our customers in order to keep them coming back to us. And it equally prompted us to open our website, um, blackandnatural.com. And <clears throat> It was a nice platform. Now we are considering working more into technology because the world now is get getting, it's a global village. And so we are s considering how we can get into technology, develop mobile applications so that we can reach out to a wider community remotely. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much, Michi, for sharing with us your experience on how COVID-19 impacted your business and how you well, had the, the, the necessary resilience to surmount this experience. Thanks a lot. Um, now let me turn to our next uh, panelist, Mr. Awolowo. Uh, um, Mr. Awolowo, as part of the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, you have been on the front lines uh, seeing the effects of the pandemic's trade restrictions. So based on your experience, uh, how have Nigerian traders been impacted during the pandemic, especially small and medium-sized enterprises? And how has the Nigerian Export Promotion Council helped to mitigate this pandemic's effects? The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Let me start by thanking WTO uh, for inviting us to the uh, public uh, forum. And I thank all the uh, panelists uh, that are here uh, with us. Uh, it's indeed uh, a very interesting take on the subject. Well, let me uh, say that um, immediately I feel uh, Mechi, uh, what she's, because she speaks for all the SMEs, MSMEs, uh, in particularly the, the West African uh, sub-region of where we were where neighbors. Uh, so our story is the same story that I w I'm hearing all the time from many of our uh, SMEs. Uh, of course, reduction in global demand for many of our non-oil exportable products where the SME traders are active uh, led to a decline, uh, of course, uh, consumer purchasing power uh, caused by the lock lockdowns. Uh, 
uh, rising overhead cost, uh, cost to the unutilized production uh, capacity. It created more debts uh, for SMEs and MSMEs. Uh, they had to lay off workers, uh, really. Uh, the cost burden on these businesses uh, to remodel their operations uh, using digitalization was very hard and also of of course compliance to physical and uh, um, uh, covid rules so we 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 had a, a case of uh, f closed orders uh, that uh, they had been working with and uh, suddenly now they were held up during the lockdown they couldn't send their goods uh, abroad they couldn't send them even for local con consumption so many and then when you look at uh, the agri sector there and perishable goods so it was a big impact uh, to 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 them uh, however uh, every story has a silver lining uh, when there was a decrease in demand for several uh, products. There was also a corresponding, uh, corresponding increase for other products such as ginger, uh, share not. Everybody started wanting to drink ginger during the COVID. So all our ginger producers were really right up and everybody wanted now to eat uh, vegetables, uh, fruits. So it was a big order for that. So then we had to now uh, help many of our SMEs uh, by freighting uh, uh, many of these goods uh, rather than shipment because I was too too far. So we had to get the government to open that part of the cargo airport uh, for us even during the lockdown because we we made a case that we really needed this uh, to go through. And uh, again, we had uh, signed a uh, a partnership agreement with UPS, uh, particularly for women-owned businesses. Uh, they get a reduction as much as 40%. So you can take your goods abroad and you have access to also UPS warehouses all over the world. So what's a, a big thing for us. So many people that were selling uh, online were able to use UPS, uh, women-owned businesses, of course were able to use uh, UPS uh, to move many of their products. So that, was, that, that, that helped uh, quite a lot. Uh, the opening of the economy uh, was such a big deal. And um, the most important thing uh, in, under the Nigerian Economic Sustainability Plan was how to save jobs and create new jobs. And that was the specific, uh, specific order of our president, uh, which led to our new hashtag, hashtag, uh, hashtag uh, uh, save, save jobs, create jobs. So he, he was particularly interested in how do we help these companies bring back the jobs? Because it's easy uh, if, uh, to, to save the jobs that already have been created. Uh, than trying to create new jobs. So save these ones and then help them to create new jobs. So that's the focus of what we are looking at. Uh, we have a, we're running a, a massive uh, grant program in Nigeria now uh, to help uh, uh, companies, uh, not only the SMEs, MSMEs, also our big companies uh, to give them some relief in order for them to save jobs, create jobs. So, and we're really focusing on the whole uh, export ecosystem uh, to, to revamp it and uh, get ready for business. Uh, as you know, Nigeria is an oil exporting economy. And uh, with the way everything is going now, uh, I, I keep telling people if we don't find another use for our oil, maybe if we mix it with honey or sesame seed and start drinking it, we're not going to be able to do anything with the oil anymore, the way oil is going. So the focus is on non-oil, uh, uh, non-oil exports. And that is where uh, the variety of uh, majority of our SMEs, MSMEs are trading. 
that's why they're creating jobs that's why they're saving jobs so that is the focus of uh, of us right now uh, we need we realize we need to uh, turn the Nigerian economy into a uh, a, a non-oil uh, uh, exporting uh, economy and that is what we are focused on right now thank you Thank you very much for your very interesting insights, I have to say. Yep, thanks a lot. Uh, let me now uh, introduce our next panelist, uh, Mrs. Fernandez Ruiz, who is joining us virtually. Uh, Mrs. Fernandez Ruiz, uh, you noted that uh, R to R's uh, supply chain and demand were significantly affected by COVID. Um, however, you managed to pivot manufacturing to other products in demand like PPE. So besides redirecting R2R's production, um, where are there other strategies you employ that help you to weather the pandemic? Uh, for example, increasing e-commerce or diversifying your inputs or markets? Please, uh, the, floor is, the floor is yours. I uh, think you are muted. We, we cannot hear you. Um, no, we, we cannot hear. Just give us some, some minutes. Um, Mrs. Fernandez Ruiz, could you try again, please? Yes, hi. Can you hi. hear me? Now we we'll, we'll listen to you very oh. clear. Go ahead. Okay, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, I did say a full paragraph already, but it's okay. I could say it again. Um, first of all, um, good day to all of you and greetings from Manila, Philippines. Um, it is an honor to be with all of you today, and it is good to see many of you together even if I'm a little sad that I could not be there in person. Um, our company, R2R, is considered part of the MSME group. And companies like ours are usually very lean. We do many things on our own, and we don't have much access to networks and resources. So we often use our resourcefulness to keep ourselves going. And needless to say, and I speak for many MSMEs, and uh, I heard about them today as well, when I say that COVID was so hard for so many, um, and especially for enterprises like ours. For the first few months of the lockdown, um, we needed to think and act quickly while at home in order to keep everyone safe while keeping livelihood going. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we created beautiful bags that are woven from dead stock fabric and fused with indigenous textiles. But during the height of the lockdown, we had to find other ways to earn revenue. So we equipped our artisans with materials and machines for them to use at home and we started making face masks and PPEs at the time when masks and PPEs were in such high demand because we had an earlier shortage. Um, but these were all stop gaps though. Uh, while we were producing these, we were also planning and implementing three key strategies. First, we started innovating on our products based on trend reports that I have been reading for fun and for work. So we created work from home outfits like the one I'm wearing right now, bags that could carry stuff as bags do, but also look good enough to display at home. Um, weave from home DIY kits among others. 
Our di our diversification, though, is very well researched using materials and publications that are available online. Second, aside from diversifying our products, we focus our retail efforts to online. Um, we have our online store, R2RPH, R2R.PH, uh, for 10 years already, but only really focused all of our efforts on it last year. And as a result, our online sales increased by 30% last 2020 and on track to increasing by 70% this year. Um, we had to rapidly learn and adapt customer acquisition techniques, partner with logistics providers and payment gateways, and create content, um, like lots of stories and even TikToks, to get ourselves out there in the digital space. And third, we surveyed countries that are managing COVID faster. Um, and then expanded our market to these areas through partnerships and collaborations. Uh, we also reached out to corporations and industries that are still thriving in this situation and proposed collaborations with them too. All these were made possible because of online platforms, social media, global networks we have built throughout the years, access to logistics providers, both local and international, and our team's capacity to learn, adapt, and even reskill really fast. Um, but while we were able to do all of these, there are still many challenges along the way. Um, for example, logistics and shipping are still very expensive and prohibitive for buyers. Many buyers from around the world require certifications that we don't have access to and don't have the resources for. And there are still information that seem to be reserved for those who can afford them. So while we're doing well and keeping things going, we still have a long way to go. Um, but being part of this forum makes me hopeful that I can be part of the solution, not just for me, but for other MSMEs around the world, together with many of you here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Fernandez Ruiz, for sharing your resilient experience with us today. Uh, I would now like to turn to you, Mrs. Uh, Maria Isabel Montoya Duarte, Mrs. Montoya, you have known the importance of moving online and analyzing digital sales opportunities for successfully navigating the pandemic's business disruptions. Um, in a few minutes, can you discuss whether turning Nick ahead sales more towards e-commerce, change its level of export or your business model? Also, what challenges and opportunities have you discovered by using online marketplaces? So, um, usted tiene la palabra. Bienvenida. Buenos días y buenas tardes para todos. Es para mí realmente un gran honor, un placer estar por aquí compartiendo este espacio con todo este panel. Eh, de todos vamos a aprender. Me siento tan honrada de saber que cada uno de los que está aquí tienen estos historia historias grandiosas. Soy de Nicaragua y para quienes no saben, es un país que une en el Istmo Centroamericano a la América del Norte con la América del Sur. Pero es un Istmo que también vive enfrentando desafíos y fenómenos naturales como huracanes, maremotos, volcanes, erupciones volcánicas, erupciones sociales. Y todo esto nos hace nosotros cada día estarnos reinventando. Justamente cuando la, la pandemia nos llegó, ya estábamos saliendo de una crisis y estábamos siendo asistidos para saber enfrentar esa crisis. Creo que esa fue la parte que nos permitió sobrevivir de alguna manera. Porque en el caso específico de mi marca, de mi negocio, eh, tenía un, un modelo de negocio que comenzó como una iniciativa social, como un emprendimiento social. Y desde ese momento trabajamos con artesanas, mujeres que viven en comunidades rurales y que trabajan desde sus casas. Entonces, cuando la pandemia llegó, no tuvimos que mover a nadie ni despedir a nadie. O sea, eso en resumen, los costos operativos no se nos vieron tan afectados. 
Sin embargo, no estábamos preparando para exportar. Estábamos emocionados porque ya íbamos a exportar. Y lamentablemente todo se nos dijo no abajo. Y todo el trabajo que habíamos hecho nos hizo sentir que, bueno, perdimos en un momento el, el tiempo eh, y creímos, ok, ¿qué va a pasar ahora? Y las mujeres no dejaban de trabajar porque siempre estaban trabajando desde su casa. ¿Qué voy a hacer ahora con tanto producto? Más bien, entonces, eh, en ese momento vino el momento que ya los sombreros no eran como que todo el mundo quería o la prioridad. Entonces, había que hacer algo con la misma materia prima que hacíamos los sombreros. Y es ahí donde entra en función la formación que habíamos tenido a través de ITC, donde nos permitían eh, identificar aquellas grandes fortalezas de nuestro producto que venía desde una comunidad que le daba un 100% de hecho en nuestro país. O sea, no dependíamos también de la importación de materia prima, que también era una ventaja, pero estábamos ya, digamos, más bien sobre estoqueándonos, llenándonos. Y vimos que sí había que reinventarnos, porque no les podía decir a las mujeres, dejen de trabajar. Más bien era hasta una terapia por la situación que estábamos viviendo. Y empezamos entonces a ver qué podía hacer con unas amigas. Creamos un colectivo que le llamamos Nica Artesana, creando redes con valor y buscando una solución, porque les decía yo a ellas, ¿qué voy a hacer ahora con este producto? No se puede exportar. Y fue así como empezamos a buscar otros puntos de venta a nivel local, pero haciendo uso de las herramientas tecnológicas del e-commerce para promocionar estos nuevos productos que estábamos creando y que fueron pensados en el confinamiento. O sea, la gente está en su casa, quiere ordenar sus cosas, quiere improvisar una oficina, está cocinando para su familia, va a ocupar cosas que quiere y no va a poder importar. Entonces nosotros tenemos que dar la solución. Y de esa forma fue como empezamos a volver a los canales que teníamos establecidos, los que quedaron abiertos, porque algunos cerraron. Y empezamos a ofrecer este producto y a venderles la idea. Lo bueno es que ya en estos canales ellos ya estaban identificados con nuestros valores, con nuestro ADN. Entonces había química con ese canal. O sea, y si hay química, hay negocio, hay business. Entonces era a nivel local. Eso nos permitió so sobrevivir. Pero teníamos siempre el problema de que queríamos exportar. ¿Y qué pasó? Todo se disparó. O sea, todos los fletes se dispararon. Entonces hemos estado hasta hoy activos, sobreviviendo y creciendo gracias al e-commerce social y local. Es una forma de hacer uso de la herramienta para educar al comprador, decirle al comprador, mira, este producto está siendo hecho a mano, tiene un valor histórico, cultural, este equipo de trabajo, estas mujeres están sintiéndose empoderadas, están teniendo independencia económica, eh, están dando salud y educación a sus hijos, a sus hijos a través de estos ingresos. Todo esto eh, nos permitió mantenernos en el mercado. Seguimos haciendo negocio, lo estamos haciendo de forma local 
y seguimos dando la esperanza y confiando en que la pandemia va a pasar. Tiene que pasar. El hombre ha tenido la capacidad de superar muchos más obstáculos. Y lo vamos a hacer. Pero entonces tenemos que estar siempre activos y pensando en que viene un futuro mejor. Entonces tenemos que estar preparados para eso. Muy bien, muchas gracias señora Montoya por compartir su experiencia con nosotros que nos muestra una vez más cómo el comercio electrónico fue una herramienta de sobrevivencia para muchas eh, micro, pequeñas y medianas empresas. Muchas gracias. Uh, last but by no means least, let me turn now to you, Mrs. Whitaker. Uh, based on your extensive trade experience, uh, how can international trade support business resilience and how can we best support this tool so that it remains available even for the next crisis? Please, floor is yours. Thank you so much and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, let me just say, Ambassador Cancela, I think a very important step has been taken this morning. And that is the recognition that we're really dealing with a um, bimodal business resilience issue. Uh, that I, I believe that the strong will continue to innovate and they will get stronger, even in a pandemic. They will be fine. We should not measure progress by the strength of the strongest, but by the progress of the marginalized. And that recognition has been very encouraging. So when we talk about how trade can support business resiliency, I want to talk about the marginalized businesses because this global trading system is only going to be as strong as its most vulnerable linkage. And I've heard some good suggestions here, but I can say for me, I've had the opportunity after serving as the assistant U.S. trade representative for Africa and being one of the, uh, uh, the developers of AGOA, um, coming out of government, I created a company and since 2003, we've done nothing but work for large multinational corporations and we're also invested in African SMEs. And in those large companies that we've worked with, we have worked with them specifically in Africa and they come to us when they want to do well and do good and incorporate uh, micro and small enterprises into their supply chain. And so what I want to say, it just takes some uh, intentionality, some intentionality, companies that are committed to doing it. But if you want to be resilient in trade, I think one of the best ways is to get those companies, I'm talking about those that are economically vulnerable, into global value chains. And I know that that can be done. I've seen, mic I've seen it done at the uh, micro level. So let me just give you just a few examples so we can move on. We're looking at a situation where African companies represent 2% of global value chains. It hasn't even moved. It's been running in place. Whereas Asia Pacific, they have 15%. And so we had to challenge. I look at a company like SAB Miller. Now, many of you who know me now, I've never drank beer. I've never drank, I'm one of the few people in the world, I've never tasted alcohol for a number of reasons. But I was so excited about SAB Miller. Um, they, they wanted to create, and they did indeed, create a new beer line with 100% local content in Africa. And they did that because they learned in East Africa Um, the um, people were communities of vulnerable people. They were using the acid from the batteries to make the homemade brew to boost the alcohol content because they couldn't afford a regular beer. So what SAB Miller did is not only did they do a safe drinking campaign with the bar, but they created a new beer with barley and, and different things, and they were committed, and I watched and was a part of how they work with smaller farmer groups. They had to be very intentional, and that's about showing this is our supply chain, this is our, they worked with development organizations. So many of the NGOs in this, uh, that are part of this aid industrial complex are not helping these micro enterprises. 
because they are too divorced from them and they have too much overhead. They need to be on the ground, as Ambassador Coke Hamilton said. And so they got with them and they opened up their supply chain and they created that beer that created so many jobs, supported so many enterprises. I've seen its work. Um, so I, I, I'm a big believer in being intentional. I, we worked for Starbucks was one of our clients. Not only did we help them uh, increase their sourcing of the primary and raw materials of coffee in Africa, we looked at other ways to do it. They opened up a farmer um, supply uh, training center so that they could coordinate, better coordinate the supplies on the ground. We had to look at why were not more countries qualifying? Because we can't expect these companies to be development agencies. Why were they not qualifying to get into the supply chain? Because nobody was organizing the supplies on the ground. You know, we had a situation where you had coffee, bad coffee mixed with good coffee beans. Nobody organized that supply. So when I hear countries talking about um, you know, we want to move up the value chain, who's going to organize the supply in the ground? You cannot get into the value chain unless you're going to, somebody's going to play that role organizing. And we brought in stakeholders in one country to or, just to do that. And Starbucks was able to go in there and, and source that coffee. We said, what are, your, what are your qualifications? And we saw that. And we also saw um, because generally we're dealing at a higher, the highest level in these uh, co uh, companies. Um, Howard Schultz himself, he started a, a program, a branding, where they branded um, African uh, enterprises, their products in all of their stores. So from music to arts and crafts, which just spurred a whole. We're not talking, we're talking about like ripples of hopes that created waves. And I saw it, so I believe in it. And I also saw where it didn't work. Um, we were working with a group of, of organic um, cooperatives, promising group, because I'm looking at the data. The organic market is burgeoning, multi-billion dollar market. And if you're landlocked, you should be thinking about organic because you're going to get a 20% um, toss up. And they had all kinds of problems. They had the problems you were talking about. Who was going to certify them? That was a big problem. We took them to a trade show, Whole Foods, knocked on the door Whole Foods. Whole Foods said, we love this. We'll take all they can produce. You know why they couldn't get in? They couldn't get in because they couldn't afford the certification. And I'm like, what body? Why, how come these um, NGOs that's getting all this development money that I don't believe is even hitting, much of it is hitting the ground in Africa, why can't they certify? Um, why can't um, they, and then we had one group, we said at least we can get them in um, for their dried pineapples, dry fruit. They couldn't get in because the moisture content was off. So with all of that development aid, and let me just tell you, development aid to Africa was $800 billion in 10 years. 10 years, we couldn't find a moisturizing machine who would pay for that? It was like about $5,000, $6,000. The government didn't have anything. The, this didn't have this one. You got to fill out. We are dealing with women who had to use their um, thumbs and fingers to sign documents. And nobody could help them get certified. But they knew their product. So these are the kind of things that I think that I've seen the evidence. Trade can make them more resilient. But we have to be intentional about getting them in the game. And we have to understand that they're not registering. Even when you talk about MSME, globally, that means $100,000 a year or below. A lot of businesses are not saying that is not most of the businesses in Africa. You may as well say a billion dollars or below because they don't see themselves in that. They're in the informal sector. So first, we need to really probably tweak that definition uh, and really include those in the formal sector. And I can tell you, I've seen it. We've been on the front line of it. You can incorporate them into global value chains with very committed partners and stakeholders.
Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Whitaker, for your very thoughtful comments and for sharing with us these uh, experiences that, uh, well, speak a lot by themselves. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Um, well, I'm afraid that we are running out of time now, um, but we have uh, another extra 10, 15 minutes, right? So uh, I want to open the session up to a discussion now with our panelists. I have some more questions myself, but I would also like to remind our audience that uh, they are welcome to pose questions either here in the room or where they may be listening to this virtually. Um, as a reminder, please submit your questions via the chat function for those with us virtually or for those here in person, please write your question uh, on the paper provided and pass it to the nearest uh, facilitator. <coughs> so, let me start with one question to our panelists. Um, given its importance in providing business with options for new markets or inputs or creating avenues for resilience when regular business is disrupted, uh, how can trade be made more accessible to businesses of all size and resources? So um, maybe we start with uh, <laughs> Mechi, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will start by giving uh, statistics from Cameroon. Our current GDP stands at approximately 39 US billion dollars. And uh, approximately 51% comes from the informal sector. So just like M Mrs. Whitaker said, uh, it's the informal sector, those small businesses on the ground level that keeps the economy running. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important that um, <coughs> these small businesses are being incorporated. How I, for one, my business has had this serious problem of organic certification. So she's telling my story, actually. So it's difficult to export to new markets because certification costs are extremely high. And it's really, um, when you look at the cost of certification, it's almost like a running cost of your business. And you're like, should I really get the certification done? By the way, in Africa, who cares about certification? <laughs> so. It's very important that we look for first and foremost small businesses who are creating impact in their communities and tell their stories. When they tell the stories, it keeps them motivated, it keeps them active, it keeps them going. For example, on coming here, my team was super excited. Now they know that, A, hey, out there in the world, they are being recognized. I even came along with brochures with their pictures on it, so they know that, oh, they are seeing me over the world. So it's really exciting and it's motivating. So if they can create platforms whereby small businesses can liaise with larger businesses who have already maybe gotten the experience out there into the world, that way we can easily maybe get the certification and maybe they equally put um, um, modalities in place that help small businesses. Like if they say, okay, certification is $1,000 for small startups with uh, income of, or revenue of $200, for example, maybe they, sh they can give 1% or 2% of that amount, but they should be able to create such avenues that enable small businesses to trade on a global level. Thank you. Thanks to you, Michi. Uh, Mr. Awolo. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, well, I'd like to... Uh, just refer to uh, what uh, my dear sister Rosa has been saying about um, uh, this help. Yes, it is, it is really hard out there uh, for SMEs, MSMEs, uh, but uh, with various uh, participation such as what uh, you did when you were in US, USTR and development of Agua, you know the, a lot of training has also gone in helping many of these uh, companies get certification, uh, you know, so I must condemn, I uh, must commend <laughs> the FDA, mm -hmm. yeah, for even coming and to certify many of our companies that I can now export to to the United States of America. But uh, making trade accessible for all businesses, especially uh, SMMEs, SMEs are. Uh, Information is critical. The access, the availability of this information should be relevant, up-to-date, accessible in different forms, electronic 
and even physically taking it uh, down the entire value chain to let them know. Then, most importantly, we have to look at innovative financial options to help SMEs, MSMEs grow. Yeah, payment systems for us in Africa, how do you move money uh, across even the region, the West African sub-region? It, it's, it's difficult. How do you move money, especially now move money to Egypt? So we must really look at these new options uh, of payment uh, uh, options. And Ambassador, that's where you, you, know, you, you must come in. I've listened to you over the years on trade. And this is really critical uh, for us, how to get this. Then, uh, of course, uh, many create more opportunities for SMEs, uh, MSMEs, to be able to display uh, their goods virtually and through the various uh, trade fairs. Uh, the USTR were the ones that really recommended to us in Nigeria that, uh, look, enough of trade fairs, look for buyers' fairs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to go to where the buyers oh. come uh, because you go to trade fair, take Mechi, and I take our products, and people come to take pictures. And that's it. Right. Yeah, because there are no buyers there. Mm -hmm. So you want to get the buyers, the buyers from Saks, the buyers from Walmart. You need them in that room to connect, uh, connect our SMEs, you know. And then continuous trading, uh, training and capacity development of exporters and aspiring exporters is really uh, going to be key. And now online uh, uh, product Training, uh, trading platforms are going to be important uh, in, in the future. And I think we really have to take uh, innovation, digitalization as our partners on this, on this, on this task. Let me thank uh, the International Trade Center for the work uh, we've been doing with them. Uh, I say the ITC is the mothership, using the Star Wars analogy that the mothership of all trade promotion agencies all over the world, we key in to them. And using their trade tools, uh, we're able to know, you know, what goods are trading all over the world, you know, on, 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 on a, 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 a daily updated basis. So you can now know that, look, you, you need to uh, start, stop producing this and start producing this. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID taught us as a uh, I think it was uh, Maria that was saying on, on fashion, they started producing uh, masks. We did that as well. All our fashion uh, companies, mostly women-owned businesses, uh, we turned them to, uh, before the masks started coming in, in donations uh, uh, from, from all over the world, they had to sew all these masks because, I mean, nobody was going for parties anyway. We love parties in Nigeria, I'm sure. Rosa, you know that. You've been to a few of our parties. So, but there was nobody, there no parties going on lockdown. So they started uh, doing masks. And we got government to support and buy for them. So to create that, uh, uh, that uh, initial uh, 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 money, economic survival uh, for them, which was good. By the time the uh, cheap masks also came, we had other factories in Nigeria who could do that, the same kind of Chinese and Taiwan masks that were coming in. So these are all the things we really need to do for our uh, SMEs, MSMEs, uh, to continue to build uh, resilience so we, we can survive. Thank you very much, Mr. Awolowo. Now I give the floor to Mrs. Fernanda Ruiz. You have the floor, ma'am. Hello, can you still hear me? I got a little traumatized if you couldn't. <laughs> Hello? Yes? Yeah, okay. we can listen, you. <laughs> okay, great. So um, for MSMEs and speaking as an MSME entrepreneur myself, um, I would say that we need many kinds of access. And I don't have enough time. We all don't have enough time to enumerate all of them right now. So I would just mention four that have impacted us the most. First is infrastructure. Because even if we try to onboard more entrepreneurs to go online, that would be very hard without internet access in the first place. So for our artisans, for example, we were able to really 
teach them how to use different messaging platforms so that we could talk to each other. But if the signal in their area is very weak, it's still very hard to communicate. Second is access to materials and tools that will help MSMEs reach customers outside of their locations. So these materials and tools include subsidized or sponsored certifications. I've heard certification so many times this, um, this afternoon, and we felt that so much a few months ago when we were required certifications that were very expensive, um, or sponsored and subsidized trend reports. These materials and tools can help more MSMEs adapt sustainability practices as well that can contribute to the economy, but also positively contribute to our SGDs. Third is access to networks that can foster collaborations and business partnerships for MSMEs. We have a lot of these networks for bigger or more high profile companies, but MSMEs do not have significant representation in many of these networks. And fourth is access to platforms like the one that we have access to right now. If we can have a bigger group of MSMEs in this forum, I would be very happy to volunteer in some capacity to make that happen. But essentially, as what Ms. Whitaker mentioned earlier, all the initiatives need to be intentional because long-term success, they don't happen by accident. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Montoya, you have the floor. Adelante, por favor. Muchísimas gracias. Coincido con varios de los puntos que han di dicho los participantes, mis compañeros acá. No quiero repetir más de algunos y quiero sí enfatizar en algo que me parece a mí que ha sido clave. Creo que la formación y la educación a los distintos sectores de las MIPIME es fundamental para crear y fortalecer la resiliencia. Eh, me parece a mí que yo estoy hoy aquí porque fui beneficiaria de, de una articulación entre distintos organismos internacionales y nacionales. Está ITC, está Está, eh, bueno, APEN, está, y están varios organismos, incluyendo la cooperación suiza, que nos ha venido dando, siguiendo. Y es, quiero aprovechar este momento también para agradecerlo. Entonces, una cosa elemental y donde deben destinar recursos es en la formación. Porque la mayoría de las MIPIME como bien lo han dicho, están todavía en el sector informal y muchas veces es porque no tienen los recursos para hacerlo, pero tienen el potencial para crear productos, beneficios, empleo. Y ya lo hemos dicho también, los números están ahí. Más del 90% de las empresas mundiales son mi PYME. Entonces, si estamos diciendo eso, es porque a ellos tenemos que dirigirnos o tiene que dirigirse, pues soy mi pyme todavía, pero aspiro a crecer. Otro punto para mí elemental y que creo que es donde se pueden destinar recursos en este momento, porque es lo que está vigente, es garantizar la accesibilidad a la vacunación para todos los sectores. En mi país más de 600 familias son artesanas. Y quizás solo un 10% ha tenido acceso a la vacuna. Interrumpa, pero le, le agradecería si puede ir redondeando la intervención porque tenemos que dejar la sala en breve. Gracias. Gracias, señor embajador. Um, muchas gracias. Um, well, um, before giving the floor to Mrs. Whitaker, let me... Um, read some questions we received from the audience uh, because perhaps Mrs. Whitaker you can also address uh, some of them. <laughs> um, you know um, there was a comment by Mrs. Uh, Bolujoko about a positive outcome from COVID regarding the virtual capacity building for certification in Nigeria. This goes in line with what Mrs. Whitaker was saying uh, on the importance of building capacity for these uh, small businesses. Then we have Joy, African Women in Trade CEO. Uh, she's asking, 
how are we including African diaspora in trade, especially in value chains and supply chains? And finally, I have a question for uh, Mr. Wolowo uh, that says, as Nigeria recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic in finding innovative ways to become resilient and build back better economy, what essential role will effective commercial diplomacy play as a force for sustainable growth and Nigeria's economic prosperity? Uh, so with that, I pass the floor to you, Mrs. Utaker. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let me just say that one thing I think that is just key to all of this, and that is the fact when we look at in Africa, we're dealing with a $331 billion gap in financing for SM SMEs. Um, and so we ought to look at how do we close that gap, because a lot of the things that we've talking about, even capacity, can be purchased if they had resources. Even extended internet can be done. And so this is how we make it more accessible. Certification could be paid for. The one thing that I believe that um, is often overlooked, we really need to establish the credit worthiness of the, um, those in the informal sector. These credit schemes and credit ratings, they, they don't, they, these are Western tools that are not even applicable to them. And yet we know that they have the best repayment records in the world, but it's not codified, it's not anywhere. We know how they buy, how they sell, how they borrow, how they send money to each other. But if they had a digital identity um, using data, I, I, I just, I, in 2020, $400 billion in mobile money transactions um, in Africa, that is enough to, for a good fintech company and some other stakeholders with intentionality to give them a credit rating. Because if they had a credit rating that with the phone as a lever, that could be used to really bring them. That's the bridge from the informal to the informal sector. It would give them access to a lot. I think even with, some, with, some, with a digital a data identity, it would go a long way to help us with the land tenure. Because how do most people exit poverty and, and get into more well-being? It's by having a house to leverage. So I think that we have to also just look at these tools. We have to close this gap. And we can do that with um, really giving genuine microenterprises a data identity, um, tweaking these credit scores um, to, so they can see themselves in it and it can work with them. These Western transplants will never work. So perhaps that's something that people can take up, I think is the next FinTech opportunity for Africa. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mitaker. Uh, Mr. Awolowo, can you give us some comments just in some seconds? Yeah, <laughs> yes, I, I know time is on. I, I totally agree with uh, what Rosa said, and I think really that's, that's the way forward. Uh, on the question on commercial uh, diplomacy, uh, yes. Uh, this is uh, extremely important on how we, we go about connecting and building trade. With the help and support of ITC and EU, we just uh, set up a, a network of um, trade promotion agencies in West Africa. Uh, I, I recently was elected president of that body. Uh, it's the ECOWAS TPO network, and so we're going to be connecting uh, to help trade. And all this, we, there was a meeting uh, in, in Nigeria one time with uh, President Kenyatta and former President Jonathan. And they, at the end of the meeting, uh, they read a communique, and the communique said, oh, trade between Kenya and Nigeria must double by in the next 10 years. So everybody applauded, but President Kenyatta said, wait a minute, what is the level of trade now? Zero. What is double of zero? Zero. <laughs> So he said, no, what should happen is the Kenya Export Promotion Agency, Nigerian Export Promotion Agency, you get together and see what we can trade. And then you can give us this, the targets that we need to meet. So that is commercial diplomacy. And that is what we're working on now. We need to build an army of exporters uh, because the, the, the next uh, war now are trade wars. 
and it's not nobody is coming to bomb mm, uh, Cameroon from Nigeria. Nobody is going to bomb Benin from. It's, nobody has time for that. What we need is trade, mm -hmm. and, and that is the way forward. And so we need to build this army of SMEs, MSMEs, exporters, and so we can improve intra-African trade, which is the lowest in the world. And that is what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me thank all our, of our panelists of today, the, the ones that are virtually present, the ones that are here with us. Uh, thanks to you all for attending this panel. And let me also thank our interpreters, because as usual, they have been very cooperative with this session, uh, allowing us to continue until the end of it. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>